Well, good morning. We are so glad that you are here with us on this cold Sunday. We believe that 100% that God is present in our gathering through his word and song. And so this morning, wherever you are at, we are grateful to be with you in this holy moment together. this morning with confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us when we were dead in sin, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And this morning, the peace of Christ be with you always. And in the chat on YouTube or Facebook or even on text, text someone that the peace of Christ be with you this morning. Let us pray together. Most holy God, 
The earth is filled with your glory, and before you angels and saints stand in awe. Enlarge our vision to see your power at work in the world, and by your grace make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 and 9 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the lord of the hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal from, that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go, and say to the people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so that they may not look into their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate. Until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even, a tenth, even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's Holy Gospel comes to us from Luke 5, the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to pull out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats ashore, they left everything and followed him. The gospel of the Lord praise to you, O Christ. So this morning we're going we're gonna to focus on the Isaiah story. It's a pretty epic story. There's angels with uh, triple wings, there's pyrotechnics and a, a smoke machine and, and a concert, all wrapped into one story. For my friend Wayne at St. Mark's, this does sound like an Iron Maiden concert, doesn't it? 
maybe different lyrics, but the author of the passage, this Bible passage, is trying to let the reader know that something amazing is happening. In fiction writing, this is known as setting the scene. The writer's establishing the characters, uh, painting a picture of a moment. Aware that human beings are incapable of handling an un unadulterated view of the divine, God communicates through angelic mediators. God uses ambassadors, emissaries. Because sometimes we have to get ready before we talk to God, especially when something important is about to happen. Isaiah sees the scene. He gets the setting. He sees how monumental of an occasion this is. I mean, just the sounds of the angels, not even God, but the sounds of the angels shook the doorposts and the foundation of the building. Isaiah recognizes at once that he isn't worthy to be on his own, to even be in, in the room. Even the angels' voices echo of unspeakable power and utter holiness. So Isaiah cries out, Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He identifies himself as a man of unclean lips, among people of unclean lips. I don't know if you've ever been to a fancy, super fancy restaurant with a dress code, uh, with a jacket requirement for men. Sometimes they'll provide you, they have jackets on hand, they'll provide you a jacket if you don't have one. Because if you aren't dressed right, you can't come in. In Isaiah's setting, an angel grabs a coal from the altar, touches Isaiah's lips, and he is cleansed. And now, and now, he's ready to hear the voice of God. He's cleansed and ready. When we come to church and we confess our sins, it, it, it's just a reminder that nobody is clean. Nobody's got it all figured out. We are all in need of God's help in our lives. No, nobody's got the right suit jacket. Through an angelic agent, God touches the mouth of the prophet with a coal from the altar and cauterizes it, removing his guilt and enabling him to take up his new vocation as God's prophet, God's voice in the world for God's people. I love this because there, there isn't a point in our lives where all of a sudden we're good enough to be used by God to, to affect others' lives. God does the cleansing and the empowering and the sending. All we got to do is just be willing. John Calvin saw here a sacramental dimension to the prophet's encounter with God the coal, the lit coal, was this, was this visible sign of an invisible grace. Why do we take communion on a Sunday morning, stand and confess our sins, remember our baptism with water, or kneel? Because a visual representation of invisible grace is needed. When we say a prayer or kneel in humbleness or take communion, we are responding to that invisible grace given to us. It is our, it is our altar call. So what happens in the space of church is this series of holy moments where a space where heaven and earth meet. Where through voice and action, we are reminded again and again and as often as we need it, that God has us. That we don't have to wait to be with God after we've cleaned ourselves up and sorted our lives and got it figured out. The church is this place for the broken, this cross 
is here for those in need of a fresh wave of God's grace in their lives. And, and you and I, you and I having experiencing, experienced that cleansing, that freedom, and that community with God and his people in this holy time and space, you and I have a mission to go and fish, to go find imperfect people just like us who are exhausted from trying to make their lives work and bring them to this holy time and space, this space where heaven and earth do in fact meet. The strangest part of this morning's passage is, is this part, verse 9, he said, go and tell the people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, turn and be healed. So remember, when something's confusing, when you get to a strange piece of scripture, you need to use your interpretive tools Remember this passage, this story is written for a specific people at a distinct time. So what is the author trying to tell the reader? What principle can we use from this? The listeners of this passage were the people of Israel and Judah, who weren't entirely sure of their place in the world. Most of life was not going good for them. They'd been split apart as a community, beaten up, oppressed, chased all over. But God had a call on their lives. They had a mission that salvation and redemption was going to come through their people. And, and not just for them, but for the whole world, even their oppressors. That was a hard concept. That's a hard concept to wrap your brain around. In a time of trouble, the tendency is to circle the wagons, uh, protect me and mine, and throw up a wall or two to wait until the dust is cleared. Maybe, maybe help others when the world looks just a little bit safer. But that's not what God asked the Hebrews to do, and it's not what God asks us to do. We can kind of tend to shoot ourselves in the invitational foot before we even get started sometimes. We can talk ourselves out of helping. What if people don't get what I'm trying to do for them? What if I say something dumb? Or, you know, I just don't know enough to help. Psychologists call this the bystander effect, that there's someone with a clear need in front of us, and yet somehow, somehow we don't help. We talk ourselves out of it. The reality is, is that every Sunday morning, we have this holy time and space available to us. We have this space and time of grace, cleansing, and community at hand. It's truly a beautiful thing. I have to tell you that there are people that need to hear for the first time in their lives that God loves them that has a plan for their lives and is not waiting for them to get better at life before joining us, that they are invited right now. And we got plenty of suit jackets for them. God calls you and me to be those inviters, those ambassadors, those emissaries of God's grace. And we're not responsible for the result. We're just asked to invite Sometimes people's hearts get hard and they just need lots of it inviting. Isaiah warned his listeners that some folks' hearts just might not be ready yet to hear about God. Not yet. But faithfulness is in the invitation, not the result. My journey to God is definitely not a one-shot approach. I grew up Catholic and when I was in grade school, I was an altar boy. I went to CCD at St. Raymond's Church in Mount Prospect, Illinois. I have to tell you, at that time in my life, I wasn't ready just yet. I often 
got babysat for stretches of time by my great-grandmother Marie, a, a very spiritual woman, and she would look after me while my parents attended uh, industry conferences all over the country. Grandma Marie, who besides teaching me to cook and take spoonfuls of terrible cod liver oil before school, also tried to get some religion in me. And I distinctly remember her yelling the Lord's Prayer at me <laughs> after we had a verbal argument one time. Like, like maybe it was some sort of incantation or something to try to get the devil out of me. When I was in middle school, my mom and I used to church hop. We would try different churches around our town uh, and see if any of them stuck or connected with us. It wasn't... It wasn't until high school that I had my own spiritual awakening and it finally clicked to a deeper part of myself. But I don't think all that I had experienced before was a waste. I think each experience prepared me for when I was ready to have my own holy moment where, where I got it. Where I finally connected the dots and realized how loved by God I was. We have no idea the impact we have on people's lives. What act of kindness or invitation to church might meet, might mean for someone. I think, I think we just need to have faith that God is in charge, orchestrating it all, and our job, our calling as faithful servants, ambassadors, and emissaries of God is to be willing to be a little awkward and invite help when we see a need in someone's life, and, and maybe even bring them to church, to this holy space where heaven and earth do, in fact, meet. Amen. Say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who's conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Equip your church to proclaim the good news that we have first received, the forgiveness and grace shown to us through Jesus Christ. Send us out as apostles, sharing the hope of your salvation with a waiting world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Holy are you, O God of hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Reveal your splendor in fiery sunsets and in deep blue twilights. Teach us to recognize you in the beauty of our natural world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Soften the hearts of rulers and governments that they perceive and tend to the needs of their people. Remove corruption and the impulse toward violence. Protect first responders and military personnel who risk their lives in service of others. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon those who look to you for hope and healing. Bless doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists, and all caregivers. Draw near to those who are scared, sick, or in pain. God of grace, hear our prayer. The disciples received help from partners as they brought in an abundant catch of fish. So strengthen this congregation's partnerships with the community organizations and ministries. Multiply our shared efforts and bring joy to our relationships. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for our ancestors in faith who boldly answered your call. By their example, give us courage to live in faith and to proclaim your mercy until the day that you gather us into your glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, we have a few announcements this morning. We, uh, if you can't tell, are, are back in our building this week. And while we are in our building in worship, we are waiting for some key numbers to go down in our area. So we're going to dip our toe into gathering uh, one bit at a time. So keep an eye on your email and our church website for updates as we open. This upcoming month, we're going to try out something new, both to give you a voice at St. Mark's, but also to help us uh, put our finger on the pulse of God's activity in our midst. In February, we will have a series of Zoom listening sessions leading up to our annual meeting. It's a time where you can hear, uh, where we can hear from you, see what God may be stirring up, and make time for teams to receive feedback on what's working and what might need some adjustment. These meetings will be centered around a topic, so keep an eye on the uh, out for a schedule. Uh, and if obviously, if it doesn't work for your schedule, we can always find a, a way or receive feedback in another way. This also allows for the congregation meeting to be just a little bit quicker uh, and also give teams a chance to receive people's comments and make some plans and uh, not need to respond on the spot during the meeting for feedback that may not engage everybody. So we are excited to try this out and see if it allows people to feel heard. Lastly, we are back with our new worship service on February 12th at 5.30 p.m. Our theme for the month is that God is present in the in-between spaces where we have to wait. This is an excellent invitation opportunity, so please bring a friend or a neighbor. It will be a creative blend of modern songwriting, updated hymns, and heartfelt liturgy. So we hope that you will carve out just an hour on February 12th at 5.30 p.m. to join us. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.